All right, we are now recording. We're starting the June Forest Working Group meeting. Okay, okay. go ahead, Ron. Great, thanks, Ron. Hi, I'm Ron Rolleri, and I've been a director for the Sonoma RCD for a while, and uh, <laughs> I'm here to learn. I still don't know everything yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to report back, <laughs> but we, uh, you know, we have another representative here that's more qualified. <laughs> Well, thank you for being here. All righty, so Alex Young. Hello, um, I'm uh, visiting from um, Ag and Open Space. I'm the Conservation EIS Coordinator, and uh, I'll be doing a, um, a demo of our VLI uh, live interactive map today. Great, would you re re um, repeat the title that you hold there at the district? Sure, uh, Conservation EIS Coordinator. Oh, great. Great, great, yes. great. Thank you. Sure. Um, so anything else, Alex? Uh, not at the moment. I, I'm just glad to be here. You know, I've attended these meetings in the past, but it's been uh, quite a while. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so Judy Rosales, yahoo! We haven't seen you for many moons. Why don't you say, you know, give your little spiel of what you're up to. Okay, Judy Rosales with the Coast Ridge Community Forest. Um, we applied for the vegetation management grant, uh, got $423,000, half of what, what we asked for to do uh, roadside clearance and, clearance and shaded field breaks on Fort Ross Road. Um, can you hear me? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hello? Yes. Oh, okay, I didn't know. Uh, okay. Uh, we're doing shaded fuel breaks and roadside clearance on Fort Ross Road. We use that 400,000 as a match for our uh, 2 million CAL FIRE grant uh, to also do Fort Ross Road. Uh, Marshall suggested that, that we apply for both, but we also have um, the ranch roads on the three subdivided ranches uh, including Fort Ross Road, we put in for equipment. Uh, the vegetation management grant is uh, paid for a chipper. Uh, they awarded chippers, three chippers in the area, one to us, one to the Wallala, uh, Wallala Ranch Homeowners Association, Timber Cove Fire Department, and uh, the Jenner Headlands. And that is to be, uh, I, I don't know about Jenner, but I know all of our chippers are to be to be used throughout the county. Uh, the money we got from them will get us started on our CEQA process. And uh, we have a couple of other air, you know, grant grants that we are exploring for um, the additional money if the Cal Fire grant doesn't come through. Mm -hmm. uh, but our big project right now is Fort Ross Road. It, connect, it connects Casadero to the coast. It's the main access road for Casadero or Cas Highway. Uh, is on fire. It's a big, uh, it's the major road in the area. We got support from all the landowners. The Berries owned the first mile of that road outside Casadero, which was good. Um, Judy, can you explain, board, the three could, you ex are on the could you explain what the work will be on Fort Ross Road briefly? Shaded field breaks, okay. roadside clearance. Okay, thank you. 30 to 100 feet. Um, we were uh, given a grant by North Coast uh, Resource Partnership for technical assistance, and they signed a contract with the RCD. So we had Jason Wells uh, develop, help develop this project, which was great. I didn't know if you're on, uh, online, Jason, um, but thank you very much. Uh, so he really put a lot of work in uh, into this project with us meeting with the landowners, touring the roads. Uh, Matt Green will be our forester for project implementation. Um, Jason's going to do a VTP for us. And uh, yeah, that's what, Great. That's Fantastic. what we're doing right now. Great progress. Congratulations on your uh, efforts to find the funding. That's terrific. OK, so we have um, a 707-965-1071 is next. I don't know who you are. 
what happened to them? They went away. Okay, so how about 707-664-9814? Are you there? We'd love to hear from you. Okay, maybe they can't, but you just listen on and, and if you get a chance to have some audio, let us know. Have a Fred Euphrat, please. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, uh, really nothing to report at all except that Snowmic, I mean, the, the boot camp thing is happening at SRJC and we're pretty excited about that. So that looks like uh, we'll be getting 10 classes that are modeled along this thing uh, out per year. Um, and I'm very excited about that. And so is uh, Jill and, and Brianna. So there's that plus, plus teaching, plus I finished my logging operation and onward, onward with salvage. That's all I've got, but happy to be here. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Devin. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Devin Friedfeld. I'm the assistant preserve manager at Pepperwood Preserve. Um, we have been working a lot on our forest monitoring. We have a five year project with California Fish and Wildlife where we are doing forest monitoring um, pre-thinning and then following up with the thinning crew um, and then prescribed fire, um, pile burning or broadcast burning. Um, so this is the second uh, year we've been doing this. Um, last year was really, uh, went really successful. We've been about 120 acres. Um, this year we're gonna do another 140 acres. Um, we're currently in the process of finishing our vegetation management plan with CAL FIRE so that they can implement um, the burn. Uh, we met with Nate Glazer, who's our new battalion chief, um, which we're really excited. I think um, we've had four battalion chiefs in five years. Oh, um, my. <laughs> yeah. So Nate is a local. He's from like Santa Rosa, uh, Cloverdale area. Um, so we're really excited. He has deep roots in this community and hopefully we'll stick around for a while. Um, yeah, so we're just kind of ramping up our forest thinning monitoring process with that. Um, and uh, Michelle Halpern, our preserve ecologist, will hopefully in the next couple of years be coming out with a report about our pre and post thinning forest monitoring. Um, and if anybody has any more questions about that, I can dive into that at some other point. But that's well, what I'll, I'll briefly say that uh, Devin gave us a fantastic site visit uh, last month, I think it was, maybe it was the month before for the Sonoma County Alliance's Environmental Committee. And it was very impressive to these uh, business community to see what has been done, but also the enormity of the situation of how much it takes to do something and how long it takes to complete a project, even with the professionalism that uh, Pepperwood has. And I think that Lisa set that meeting up for us at site visit. So I just wanna uh, give a big shout out. Devin was fantastic. So thank you for that. And I'm on that committee. So I will continue to follow up with them and see how we can uh, enhance the Alliance's role in, in all of the work that we're doing. So Brooke Edwards, take it away. You guys have just jumped on. Um, uh, so I imagine I'm giving updates. We were able to bring in State Coastal Conservancy grant money for uh, maintenance of our East Ridge Shade fuel break. And so that's going to cover about 130 acres of maintenance work on resprouting shrubs and trees, as well as continuing uh, the, the thinning process up on our East Ridge. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. And then we also uh, got word that we received a grant from the Open Space District to just some equipment to help staff keep shaded fuel break maintenance type work in-house. So hopefully we'll be moving forward with purchasing a, a, a masticator uh, that will allow staff to uh, keep up on the maintenance of our shaded fuel break work 
uh, it will allow us to um, keep the costs down. And really we could probably do about 20 to 30 acres every year. And by the time we get done with our full 200 acres of Shan fuel break maintenance, you know, we can start again at the beginning, kind of like uh, painting the Golden Gate Bridge, so to speak. Uh, so, so we are looking forward to purchasing that equipment. Uh, it will give us a lot more flexibility and efficiency. Uh, so those are two great uh, grants that we brought in. And then along with that, we just received our revised, renewed vegetation management plan uh, with CAL FIRE. Uh, so now once again, we can apply prescribed fire to the Jenner Headlands. And with all of this maintenance work happening uh, this summer and fall, uh, we'll have a lot of acreage for CAL FIRE to work on in terms of prescribed fire. Uh, so as you guys know, we've used, we've worked with CAL FIRE and have applied uh, prescribed fire to about 50 acres uh, before over the last couple of years. Uh, and so now we will probably have, you know, 130 acres ready for uh, prescribed fire. And so we'll be working with Ben Nichols and Marshall uh, Tuberville on that. Uh, and then a quick update for uh, Pole Mountain. Uh, they are working on uh, taking down the Pole Mountain lookout uh, to replace that structure because it's, it's not safe anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but they will be keeping the, the cameras and all of the uh, communication uh, equipment up on poles uh, so that we will have uh, cameras uh, looking for any type of uh, fire starts. Um, and then they'll be rebuilding that. I'm not sure of the time frame on that, but uh, I know they will be taking that down that structure in the next couple of months is what I've been told. So that's a quick update from Jenner Headlands and Pole Mountain. Thank you so much. Um, let's see here. How about Carleone? Nice to see you again, Carleone. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody's faces too. Um, we're just still um, lugging forward with that CWPP. We're um, starting to work on integrating the um, comments and input that we got from all the public meetings, which were great. We got a lot of, a lot of data there. So then we went to the steering committee who had some requests on um, how we're dicing and slicing that information to um, push it out. So we're starting to work on sort of rejiggering how we're talking about various things, like how we're talking about forest management versus near home fuels and stuff like that. And as soon as we get that, we will start working on the draft and um, we'll be putting that up for review um, really soon. Um, really, 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 really please encourage you guys to all get into the hub map mm -hmm. to post in your comments, your projects, a complete project list will be super helpful. And um, we're really hoping that you can plug those into um, our hub map site and I'll paste that into the chat at some point um, before we go. Um, but without your input, um, your input won't be in there. So um, please do go to the hub and feel free to contact us um, via email is probably best with any thoughts, issues or questions. Um, we'll be following up with some targeted outreach to a variety of different stakeholders um, before we're closing up the sort of public input piece of the movie um, at the end of August. Um, then we'll be working on the draft. Um, we could have a draft as early as um, uh, October 1st, but we're concerned that if we then have a draft and we put it out for to do meetings and stuff right in the middle of fire season, it's gonna be a problem for getting um, fire department um, participation as well as for the public. So we may sort of push the schedule of public review and adoption out until the new year. And we're on the fence about that at this point. Um, any questions? Yes, I have one, uh, Carleone. And are business groups or individual businesses involved and helpful and knowledgeable? And are, you know, how, how can we get them involved if they aren't? Um, if, if you have some people that need to be reached out to, reach out to them and have them get in touch with, with us. I mean, okay. I, I don't know how to reach out to 
Are you talking about like forestry consultants and those guys? No, of I'm talking about like the uh, Sonoma County Alliance, which is the biggest organization of businesses in the county. And, and there are other businesses, groups like Chambers of Commerce and that have a, a direct um, uh, relationship with the situation with our wildfires and want to see, you know, better practices and more uh, activity uh, to prevent uh, wildfires. And so they have a big interest, but I just, it sounds like they are not yet involved. And so I will do what I can to let them know, to contact you to see how they might get involved. Or if you can send contact information to me, that might be best. Send their information to you. Sure. For, for sure. Uh, that's yeah. great. I will. Yeah. Thank you. And anybody be else? Because uh, the other thing I had to ask was uh, how uh, some groups are just finding out about this hub and that the importance of it and getting their projects in. So how long is that going to be available? Uh, if, if Say if the last you know minute this year, uh, somebody hears about it and they haven't put in their projects yet. How long um, is that a uh, process? August August 31st is when we have, we have to close it down in order to get the plan done. Uh -huh. So we can't just leave it open indefinitely and then we'll okay. open it up again next year to be updated. Okay, okay, that sounds great. That's how, that's how that works. Okay, thank you, thank you. Oh, Ronnie, ooh, ooh, what happened? Maybe I can suggest that partners put in their um, their projects through the, the hub map. Is that what you said, Karen Leon? Maybe they should put, if you can put it in, in before the next forest working group meeting, which is July 15th, then we can kind of talk again at that meeting about um, any lingering input that you'd like, Karen Leon. That'd be great. And I was kind of thinking that, but thank you for saying that. It, Adriana, that's exactly what I'd like to do is that we could at least figure out who's got their projects in and know if there are people that we'd like to reach out to and specifically ask who can. So thank you, that's a great idea. Great. And Adriana, um, what was I gonna say? Uh, 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 never mind. can't think of it. Um, Erica Warren. Hi everyone, nice to see everyone. Um, our updates from Sonoma Ecology Center are that we, um, the few that I will do that Ellie won't cover are that we had a really successful prescribed fire on June 4th. This had been rescheduled from May 21st due to, due to wind conditions. Can everyone hear me? Great. Um, we partnered with Good Fire Alliance, Fire Forward, um, and also Prometheus Fire and Sarah Gibson from Sonoma Fire Department, um, who's training to be a fire boss, um, a burn boss, I should say. And uh, just had a spectacular time. Everything went super swimmingly, uh, burned 11 acres on Van Hoosier Wildflower Preserve. Um, I managed logistics and loved it, would love to do more of it in case this group is ever looking for extra assistance. Um, in addition to that, Sonoma Ecology Center, I know this is forestry working group, but Sonoma Ecology Center is also doing a big push to increase our creek stewardship in partnership with the region. So just a big shout out there in case we have like a micro uh, grant for this and are looking looking for bigger partners um, to make it happen. Um, and in addition to that, um, I had a successful presentation to Pepperwood's second ever climate stewards education program. And just wanna give a shout out to that education program. Um, and in that presentation, I thanked partners and presented on the success of our small part that we played towards the water um, watershed task force through the through the county, um, and then finally, um, I've been managing um, rangeland grazing projects on Montini. I should say micro; these are micro rangeland grazing projects, and they've been great. Totally recommend two rock grazing in case ever anyone's ever looking for another company. Um, they were fun to work with. Um, we plan to use them going forward, and um, and it was it was cool to manage a small contract on public lands. Um, I think that is about it. Thank you all so much. Well, uh, thank you, Erica. And I just want to say to everyone, remind everyone that forests are m much more than trees. They're a mosaic uh, of you know land uh, types that uh, are 
woven together. And so to have you be concentrating on creeks and streams is a, is a critical component to forest. So thank you for that. I'm going to drop a link in the chat, Dee. I, I also um, create a mentorship program for women in the environmental movement. So if anyone is looking for staff, reach out to me and I'll share it with this mentorship group. For, for reaching out to women? For women in the environmental movement. Well, my goodness, that's fantastic. We should Great. put it on our website. Oh my goodness, um, that'd be fabulous. <laughs> okay, Ellie, your turn. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, Erica, for covering those bases. Um, so I have three items that I have uh, give you an update since the last meeting. Um, FireSafe Sonoma, as many of you know, have the, the FireWise Alliance, where they get people together once a month and give presentations. Um, the folks are uh, run, uh, they're the leaders in FireWise groups and uh, FireSafe groups and COPE groups and so on. So they had... Um, asked us to this SEC to give a presentation about best management principles and practices for vegetation, fire fuels, vegetation management. And we did that on May 27th. And uh, Caitlin Cornwall, Jason Mills, and I gave that presentation. And it was, it was partly covering how to do defensible space in a way that supports biodiversity, and then also going out into the wildlands. And uh, Jason you know, I did my part for the defensible space and Jason did the wildlands part and, and it was very well attended and I think that um, very well received. One of the things that came from it was um, many of the, the Firewise and COPE groups really want training on how to do the vegetation management in a way that, that serves wildlife as well as humans. And um, we talked about the idea of developing some training programs and I would love to have, you know, folks, I'd like to start putting that together. I, I haven't really had time to think about it since the 27th. So if anybody wants to participate in that process, um, let me know. Let's see. Um, oh, SEC, but um, regretfully, Jason Mills has uh, departed from SEC. Um, I believe he may be going to WRA. I just recently... Um, uh -huh did a, um, an interview uh, ref reference with them. And anyway, I think he's going on to great things, staying in this business. So we'll definitely be hearing from Jason Mills. Um, we're gonna continue to part with, partner with him on projects. Um, and thanks to Jason, we still have a number of post-fire fuels management projects. Um, and some of them actually have a lot of large dead trees, some of which we will need to fell, and we don't actually have the, the skills for that. So if, if anybody could recommend a tree company that could uh, remove some dead trees, and not for any kind of forestry um, you know, use, but just to whatever, chip them or biochar or whatever, please let me know. We can deal with the small stuff, but we can't do the big stuff. And then the last thing is um, the Resilient Landscapes Coalition won a $110,000 grant from the PG&E, the county funds, to do um, a year's worth of, of our workshops and also to develop some videos to improve our website and um, to, to do some trainings for um, contractors who will be doing maintenance in the defensible space. That's the defensible space part. Um, so I have, I also have, anyway, I'm, I won't go into that, but um, just to let you know that that happened. And then another thing is Oakmont, the, the, the community of Oakmont has really gotten enthusiastic about having us work with them on all levels. Um, and it's been really fun because Oakmont has 32 different HOAs and it's, it's a little bit crazy, but it's wonderful to work with a community that's, that's super firewise oriented, not just defensible space, but they have a tremendous amount of wildland landscapes. So you'll probably hear me talking about them a little more in the future. That's it. Um, Ellie, that's a good uh, thing to know. What, what do you estimate the wildland acreage to be of, uh, that's, you know, within the Oakmont uh, communities? Well, I'd say a couple, uh, a couple of hundred acres, um, and that's including Wild Oak, which is a separate community yes. adjacent right. to and access through Oakmont. Right. And the interesting thing is that um, we just did a, a, a very extensive fuels, fire fuels assessment 
for them and we're doing it for Wild Oak as well. And, and we're also looking at um, the state park, Annadale State Park, which, which abuts both of them and, and has potential you know, serious consequences if not well managed. So we're partnering with state parks about that too. Um, and, and you know, we, we're always welcoming partners, collaborators in this work that we do because you know, we're a small agency. We have one crew of four people and um, with all the work we're doing, we can't do it all. And, and it's, I think it's, it's becoming more and more evident that we need to be teaming up and you know, building these crews so that we can do this work really well. I'd like to have um, a, a time to discuss um, a fuels assessment process. So if we could put that on, on the list, Adriana, for a future discussion, whether or how long, I don't know, but that, that's a, a big uh, piece I'd like to understand, as well as what to do with the stuff that we take out of the forest uh, that, that could be useful, but is currently uh, not being, you know, not being part of a, the um, a positive process. That's rather a what do we do? So anyway, that's those are yeah. Ideas. And I, I'd suggest actually trying to corral Brock Dahlman because he has some great ideas. Okay, um, good idea. That he's doing, which are a little bit off the radar. Like he's he uses some of the fines to stuff gullies. And um, it's, uh -huh. you know, there, there's some water quality issues about it, positive and negative, but it's uh -huh. fascinating to hear what he has to say. And um, we, we just did, a, as I said, an extensive fire fuels assessment that which I'd be happy to share with you for Oakmont. It's really, it's a beautiful thing because Jason went in and identified all the different plant communities, all the sensitive species in there, made recommendations. Excellent. And I, I think it can be used as a template. Okay, we probably need to go on, but thank you. We'll we'll definitely try to schedule something, um, you know, along those lines. Miss Jill Butler. Jill, do you want to unmute yourself? Or there you go. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Jill Butler, uh, representing the Lala River Watershed Council. Um, I wanted to start by saying I heard a rumor the Watershed Council had dissolved, and I want to clarify that uh, mm. uh, we are um, still doing everything, but we're not doing it out of the office we had been in for 25 or so years because the property changed hands and we got kicked out. <laughs> So we are uh, operating remotely, as many people have been, uh, but uh, definitely still uh, ongoing and uh, looking forward to um, future projects, uh, including one that probably Jason Wells will have more uh, to say about shortly. And um, uh, we're able to uh, scrape together doing um, the stream temperature monitoring uh, this summer, which will be to a little lower level than what we've done in years past, but comparable, which is which is good because we have 25 years of data and wow. felt it was important to try to keep that effort going. Um, so that's that's it for Watershed Council. And then as Fred mentioned, um, I got to meet with him and Brianna in person, <laughs> in person. So I thought that was newsworthy and I would mention <laughs> that it was nice to actually sit down with people. And it's always great to go to Shown Farm. Can you give a brief description of the boot camp concept for us? Um, well, and, and uh, Fred, and I, I, I haven't seen Brianna's name, if, if you guys chime in if you want. Um, really briefly, I, I'm going to say it's going to be a little um, more uh, in-depth version of the forest stewardship uh, workshops that we've been doing, you know, off and on, however long it's been, 15 years or something. Right. Uh, Going on 20. Wow. 
<laughs> so uh, it'll occur over uh, two days instead of one. Um, and uh, at least portions of it will be done hands-on. So we're adding components like uh, chainsaw and tool use. And we'll actually be able to, you know, go out on Shown Farm and people say that, you know, uh, landowners that, that know they should be cutting something other than what we've done in the past, which was to explain what they should be doing, they'll get uh, some hands-on experience too. Terrific. So, Terrific. Fred, Fred, do you want to add anything to that? If they do, they can, uh, we'll give them time. But All let's right. move on. Thank you very much. How about Joe Seal and Sam Erickson? Hi, uh, I'm Sam Erickson. This is my first meeting with you guys. I'm a uh, intern over at NRCS uh, studying forestry right now. And I guess I'm just here to listen in and learn from you guys. And I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Great, becoming a forester, we like it. And oh, yeah. uh, Sam, what do you want to say? Oh, I'm Sam, this is Joe. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe, Joe. Hey, hey. hey guys, I, uh, I just started last month. I'm the new forester uh, planner here in Petaluma, but uh, I don't, uh, still learning what the programs are to begin with, so I don't have a lot of updates for you guys. And, uh, not really my place to talk about them anyways, <laughs> but, uh, uh, all I can really talk about is the, the sign up period for uh, Equip CIC. Um, there's not a lot of forestry programs in there. If you guys have heard anything about it or not, but there's uh, there is a prescribed burning uh, practice in there, which is uh, good. Um, Joe, did you say you are a forester? And if you are, are you working for someone? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, we're both here at the NRCS office, uh, field office okay. in Petaluma. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I guess just say a little more about your background, I guess, would be the one thing you could talk about. Where are you coming from? Yeah, uh, well, I just came recently from uh, Tennessee. I worked for the state of Tennessee as the area forester there. Um, I worked for the U.S. Forest Service in Montana and uh, Washington State. Wow. Uh, Illinois, Kentucky. I bounced around a little bit. Well, wow, that's... <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. It's a really great place. It's uh, working with Drew and, and Jeff Kelly. It's, it's been good so far. Well, terrific. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you stick, uh, stick around. How about Peter LaCourt? Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Well, my name is Pierre LaCourt. I'm the forest manager for Pacific Union College out here in Napa County. I'm also a board member of the Napa Communities Firewise Foundation, which is the Napa Firewise body. Uh, I was born and raised here in Anglin. I'm very passionate about the forest in this area. And so while I'm kind of a neighbor to you guys, I'm really eager to collaborate with y'all because frankly, you have better forested land out there in Sonoma County. So <laughs> it's an honor to be part of this group here today. Uh, I presented to you, Dee, were you gonna say something? No, go ahead. Okay. I presented this group about three, four months ago on some of the work that I've been doing here in the PUC forest. I've been managing this land for about three and a half years. It hasn't seen a fire since 1931. So it is significantly overgrown due to the past century of fire suppression. So a lot of what I do is frankly trying to restore the ecological balance that we're missing because of that lack of fire. I also do some management of conservation. So we've got two conservation easements on our forest here in PC. And then I also do some recreational management as well, which is a fun extra thing that I get to do. Uh, again, it's an honor to coordinate with you guys. I'll be honest that my career goal is to help manage the coastal forests of Sonoma County. So if anybody's looking for a forester one day, let me know. Uh, the most exciting thing happening in my world right now is Napa County recently approved a significant amount of funding for Napa Firewise to help us enact a five-year plan that we created to protect our uh, rural communities here in Napa County. During the CAL FIRE fire prevention grants of a year and a half ago, Napa Firewise applied for many. And as many of you know, when you apply for these CAL FIRE grants, heartbreak is very common. The one <laughs> grant that we did get was $100,000 to fund the creation of our Napa County-wide Community Wildfire Protection Plan, or CWPP. 
So that plan was created over about a year from February 2020 to February 2021. It was created by the awesome team of Esther Mandano and Carol Rice and Tracy Cadelman that I know does some work for y'all over in Sonoma County. What we did with that product when we finished it was we coordinated with Napa County Fire with our five-year community wildfire protection plan to create, again, a five-year plan of how we want to address fuel mitigation strategically to help protect our vulnerable communities in Napa County. So we brought this plan to the Board of Supervisors two or three months ago, and they approved funding of year one for the plan, which from what I understand comes out of some big PG&E settlement fund, which again, something that you guys have coming over in Sonoma County. That's so right. our supervisors decided a good use of some of that PG&E funding, $5.4 million, was to fund year one of that five-year plan drawn by Napa Firewise. And I'm here in Angwin, which is a forested community in a town above Napa Valley with about 5,000 people. We are the most vulnerable spot in Napa County. So about 3 million of the initial 5.4 is coming to Angwin and I get 1 million for my forest. So it's very exciting times in my world right now where, as you know, we're all scraping the bottom of the barrel to try to get the funding. And I'm personally starting to see it roll in. So that's one of the most exciting things that I've got going in my world right now. The supervisors are talking about, okay, we funded year one of the plan. How do we fund year two, three, four, five, and beyond? Right, right, We're right. looking at maybe a quarter cent sales tax. Uh -huh. um, there's different ways to go about it. It could be a property tax. It could be a bond. But what I'm hearing is the supervisors are maybe looking at a quarter cent sales tax. That's not popular with all of them, partly because of COVID and we're coming out of economic hard times. And yet I don't think that we can let one disaster stand in the way of preventing the next one. That's my opinion. <laughs> so that's one of the biggest funding mechanisms that I have coming into my forest here. Uh, I was also recently reached out to by the Napa County Resource Conservation Districts to partnership on a $1 million grant from the Coastal Conservancy that we did get to fund three recreational forest management projects here in the Angwin area. So that's another funding opportunity that I have at $260,000. I'm working on a Cal Fire Forest Health Grant in about the range of $5 million. That's really what will solve all my problems. I just applied for that. I'm hearing that I stand a pretty good chance of getting it. So, you know, fingers crossed on that one. I also get a little bit of NRCS grant funding. So big shout out to my partners over there at the NRCS. Really thankful for it. They've kind of helped me get some of my initial projects going that have been documented that I can get work done. And it's showing big funders that I'm trustworthy of having larger grant dollars come in. So the NRCS has played an invaluable role in helping me here in my forest. Last but not least, I've got a little PG&E grant coming in here soon for $50,000 to do some broom removal in an area under some power lines here in Angwin that recently saw fire. And I'm actually working with Sonoma Ecology Center on that. So shouts out to my partners at the Sonoma Ecology Center. And rounding out here with the last of my five minutes, it's evident here that no one funding source can do the work that we need to do, frankly, and no one organization can do it. So I would like to outline what I was hearing earlier that it's a combination of you know group efforts and funding sources that's going to get this work done that we need to both protect our homes and wildlands as well as our valuable ecosystems so that's a little portion of my world here in napa county and again an honor to share with you guys today well it's so lovely to have uh, our neighbor um napa join us Absolutely. They, we several of us do work uh in in napa in various ways but to have you be joining us on a regular basis has been absolutely so. well and it has been pointed out to me that i mean i will shamefully admit it here some of your guys's recent fires in sonoma county have come over the border here from yes, napa county. well wow. so on, on behalf of napa county i'd like to apologize <laughs> for that and say that we're working on it for you guys yeah, well, and we're we're working on it from our end too to protect you all. Uh, uh, it, it it doesn't just come one way. Absolutely, uh, Kim Batchelder. Morning, folks. It's great to hear hear and see everybody. Uh, it just really always impresses me all the great work that you guys are doing. So uh, kudos for that. Um, I I'm really excited to say that um, uh, that uh, I've been tagged for managing the vegetation management um, project uh, through the open space district. Uh, and the exciting news from each one of your projects that got approved. So I just had kind of run through the list there were $3.7 million that were approved by the board of uh, supervisor uh, for 20 different approved projects throughout the county. 
And it's super exciting because they really run the gamut. They run, they include things like um, education, uh, fuels assessment is one of the grants that was approved for uh, Fire Safe Sonoma. Um, they also include a lot of uh, roadside treatments, uh, which is a high priority for various communities throughout the county, as well as comprehensive vegetation management on larger landscapes. So, um, it's really exciting to see the different efforts and uh, the unique approaches that each is uh, uh, providing. There were over 95 applicants in this first round. So um, I think a, a large part of them had some issues with uh, CEQA compliance, whether there was a, a, a notice of exemption was appropriate for some of these uh, proposals. But for the most case, uh, they are going to work with Permit Sonoma to figure out exactly how to uh, submit the proper uh, documentation and get those projects uh, funded and, and on the ground and working as soon as possible. So we're cranking away and getting those grant agreements out to all the different partners. Uh, many of the people who spoke today um, have received their grant agreements and are signing them and we're moving them through the picture or through the process. Um, Judy, I'm happy to say that yours was finally approved but, uh, for the PG&E funding. So we're moving forward on that one. Um, so uh, the other um, projects that I've been working on is uh, one with uh, Fred Euphrat and Monica Del Martini and Roger Sternberg. We're hoping to do a salvage harvest on, um, south, on the Saddle Mountain open space preserve that got burned in the glass fire. Um, the unique case here is that PG&E has already felled some very significant uh, dug furs along the right of way. And so we wanna be able to use um, a, an emergency notification to be able to <clears throat> utilize that, uh, that uh, timber uh, and send it to the mill. And so we'll be working with uh, an LTO to assess uh, the uh, access issues. And then uh, because we already have those trees on the ground, um, we. Uh, we're, we've been working with our uh, forest ecologist to determine what are the areas within the preserve we could actually proactively salvage harvest and have a positive uh, impact on the preserve itself. So this is new uh, waters for the egg and open space. And so we're gonna just kind of go through this uh, slowly and carefully uh, with the good input from uh, Fred and Roger to determine exactly the best way to go about this. And next week, we'll be having some of the environmental agencies, uh, such as uh, um, uh, Fish and Wildlife, as well as the uh, uh, Water Board, uh, to come out and just give us their heads up on things that they want to see as part of the project design. So that's all I wanted to share with you all today. Thank you. Robert Aguero. Hi, everyone. Uh, Robert Aguero, uh, RPF over at uh, Permit Sonoma. Uh, I'm just going to be listening in right now. I don't really have any major updates, um, but if anyone has any questions about county planning, county permitting, land use issues, feel free to reach out to me. You know, Robert, I, I thought I heard that you had some new um, responsibilities over there. Is that true? Oh, well, I get responsibilities every, every day, it would seem. Um, I'm probably um, I mainly oversee CEQA projects, planning projects, private projects. I don't know if it involves forestry at some level in the county. I'm probably got my fingers in it. Um, so I'm kind of all over the place right now. <laughs> okay, fine, fine, fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Shanti Edwards. She's Hi, married to Brooke, by the way, you know. <laughs> We're all connected here. So a quick update, um, I'm the stewardship project manager for the Sonoma yes. Land Trust um, on the Sonoma Coast Preserves of Pole Mountain and Little Black Mountain. And uh, we too have received some important funding from uh, local partners and agencies like the State Coastal Conservancy, uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service and a private foundation. So this summer, we're gonna be working on shaded field break maintenance at Pole Mountain as well as connecting an evacuation route between the two properties. <clears throat> and that's a, a really important step for uh, creating a link between um, the Muniz Ranches community on the coast and the Casadero neighbors um, on the Casadero side of Little Black Mountain. 
So we're really excited about being able to do that important work. And then we're hoping we'll have NRCS approval for the shaded fuel break on Little Black Mountain this winter. Um, so that's where all of the work will culminate. And um, if not this winter, then next winter. But all of this is um, in conjunction with what um, other staff at the Land Trust are doing on other preserves across the county. And uh, we're super appreciative of the funding and the um, just how much people are collaborating and um, there's so much momentum and we're thrilled to be a part of it. And that's uh, Shanti and others, uh, everyone actually, uh, the, the folks that have been getting these grants and this funding, um, this, I, I wanna just see a hand raising. Are you guys able now to create some new jobs because of this funding or looking for new people? So I'm just looking to see if actually there are new jobs being created from this, from this uh, additional money. Is that not happening or it is happening? Just a show of hands for now, because we are running out of time. I, I wanted to pipe up that the Sonoma Valley Wildlands Collaborative that the Sonoma Land Trust is the fiscal sponsor of or uh, coordinates is seeking a new coordinator uh, for that role. And that's um, working with the, the partners in the Sonoma Valley to implement the CAL FIRE grant. So it seems like folks in this um, meeting would want to know of that um, happening right now. Okay. So and look on the Land Trust website. Thank you. Zia Marie Carlson. Maria. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Zia. I'm a member and co-owner of Monin's Rill. We steward 400 acres in Upper Mark West Watershed um, and also part of the Friends of the Mark West Watershed. And so we're um, still in the midst of glass fire recovery, doing salvage logging and um, lots of conversations and research about how we can best steward the land post logging. Got to go over to Pepperwood and see what Devin's been doing over there and um, talk to Monica Del Martini as well. And um, we are, um, Jason Wells has been helping us get into the North Bay Forest Improvement um, Program to help do some stewardship work on the land. And we're also participating, a few of us in the UCANR's Forest Stewardship uh, course to update our forest management plan, which is about 20 years old, so needs lots of updates. So that's a great course. It's been really helpful to us. And um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, Jason. You, your name has been, you know, mentioned many times. Why don't you take yeah, it, I was, it away? I was just starting to write because I have to leave at 11. Um, so uh, first thing is that the Sonoma RCD was awarded or is preliminarily awarded um, a grant from the Board of Reclamation for um, basically creating a series of public meetings to develop a watershed management plan for Wallala. So really excited about that. They haven't had a real watershed plan developed for the but it, about 20 years now. The Wallala Ranch you're speaking of? No, Wallala, the watershed. Oh, the um, watershed, fantastic. Yeah, so that's gonna be over the course of three years, basically setting up a number of public meetings to solicit input on basically creating a list of goals, objectives, and high priorities for conservation in the watershed. What, what sorts of updates can we do to that 20 year old document? Um, it's a NICWIP, which I'm blanking on what it was, <laughs> what that stands for. Jill knows more. Um, anyway, there's that. There's the North Bay Forest Improvement Program. The first round has been basically figured out who, who was getting money. And so I submitted notices of exemption and we're writing contracts. And so hopefully people are going to get started on that next month. Um, Cal Fire has contracted with uh, Sonoma and Mendocino and Napa counties to conduct cone crop surveys. And so we're looking for opportunities to go, one, expand their historic routes. Uh, so we need, and I should submit this to the listserv would be a good idea, but um, I'm gonna be looking for private landowners that are willing to let me out on their property to go and look for uh, cone crops. They're really looking for all the trees at this point. Um, so in the, in years past, they've sort of asked for like specific seed zones or specific areas within that seed zone. And uh, the, the 
seed bank situation is at a point where they're they they just need anything um so wow. so that's kind of cool i'm going to get to drive around and and binocular look at trees um so that'll happen uh i wanted to promote that that forestry workshop that uc is putting on uh is really about developing management plans interested to hear more about what fred and jill are doing um because i do think that that is I think that, you know, creating these management plans is a big hurdle um, in terms of, I mean, I think it's a necessary hurdle. I think it's something everybody needs to do, but um, to funding and then getting projects done. So um, being able to really work with landowners to, to prioritize uh, and understand how to manage land. Um, and then I've got... Uh, yeah, just happy that grants are done for the moment. Um, and that I just wanted to plug that I'd kind of like to have a meeting at some point. I don't know how feasible this is, but with the awardees of the PG&E grants, just to sort of discuss like what projects were actually funded, uh, what possible collaboration could happen in the future to build on those things. I wanted to plug that CWPP hub map that Carleon was talking about. I think that's a really that's one way we could visualize where projects are happening throughout the county and, and get a little information on what they are um, so that when we're trying to plan for the future, we can kind of understand what else has been done and what's moving forward. Um, question was, do I have cap capability to still do forest management plans? I'm not currently accepting more management plans. Um, just I'm, I'm working on them, I, I, but I have about a dozen that I have backlogged. So I want to get those done and then look at the funding situation that I still have. Um, and then if we can figure out our funding source uh, for planning um, in a year from now, then I'll you know look into to doing more of that. Other than that, we could always do fee for service. So if people are willing to do fee uh -huh. for service, that's uh -huh. one thing. Well, thank you, Jason. That's um, my update. How about uh, yeah. Jean, Jean Chin? Welcome, Jean. Unmute yourself, Jean. Oh, you're not even there. Okay, Adriana. We'll get Jean in a minute. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. I don't have uh, many more updates to add, and I'm just curious to hear from everyone else, so I'll, I'll just skip over myself. Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, so, um, Jean, are you there? I think we'll have to get her at another time. Did I miss anybody else? Okay. If we, um, I just wanted, since I was thinking about when we come to the end of this, I wanted to circle back with Robert. Um, I don't know if he has how much time he has today, but it, just to get a scoop on the um, county's tree ordinance, um, just kind of where that stands. And, um, we can talk a little bit more about that after Jean has given her update, if, if that's okay. Yeah, Jean, update from you. You're not, you, unmute yourself first. Got it. Okay, sorry, I, I just jumped on. Um, I was in an interview this morning with KZYX in um, Mendocino County along with um, Nancy Macy, who is chair of our um, Sierra Club statewide um, utility wildfire prevention task force. Um, there's been a clear cut of a huge swath um, in Redwood Valley uh, in a riparian area. Mm. And, you know, it's really brought an uproar from some people. Um, and sadly, we're finding that a number of the landowners are younger people in their 30s who are working and not really environmentally conscious and just saying, Oh yeah, take it. You know, people um, have so much PTSD and fear from um, the fires that happened, and people were killed, children were killed, that, and a lot of homes were lost. Um, that I don't think they realize they have a right to get notice, a right to refusal, a right to collect damages, a right to have a real RPF uh, look at what's going on instead of an arborist that maybe has two weeks training. So anyway, that's. Um, and PG&E ultimately really 
um, they need to upgrade their, their infrastructure because that costs a lot less and it lasts 40 years uh, than doing all their cutting trees down. So mm. really her horrific thing that's going on. Um, yeah. So anyway, another thing that, um, that I've done is with, with this, um, with Sierra Club is put out a petition um, uh, for people to sign, to, um, just to sign so we can get an, uh, you know, get p an awareness of people who, who understand that, that there are issues with PG&E and we need to um, take them to task because they're non-transparent and they're um, taking shortcuts just to um, save them money. Um, you can than... put that information if you want to in the chat of how, so, to, how people could get uh, involved if they wanted to. You know, oh, okay. You mean for the petition? Take some action. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I will do that. Um, thank you. And then um, with the Fire Safe Council that I, uh, I'm chair of at the Western Hills, uh, we have a lot going on. Our battalion chief and fire marshal have asked that um, we're a wooey fire safe council and, and some are much more rural roads. Some are right in town on the edge, um, but we've been asked to have the uh, reflective address signage, uh, which only costs $20. Um, and then a $7 metal pole to put it. And then there are parameters from Cal Fire um, that uh, how high they should be, that they should all be. And we're trying to get everyone to have them so that when it's dark or when it's very smoky, um, that their headlights reflect off of those signs so they know where they are. So that's a push that we're doing right now with our Fire Safe Council. And uh, we have a a, a grant for vegetation management from 20 from the center line of the road 20 feet out to buzz the grasses and take away brush and overhanging trees so that's but we have to get landowner signatures from every single landowner <laughs> or it can't be done on their property alongside the road it's a big effort um, so there's a lot going on right now with the fire oh, safe council i appreciate that um, and then Robert, uh, Adriana wanted to ask you about the tree ordinance. Yeah, so I can just give a brief update. Um, nothing hasn't changed, I guess, since probably the last time I was at this meeting. Uh, we had a board of supervisors uh, listening workshop on May 18th, um, where we got public feedback and heard got direction from the board. Um, but right now we're just kind of in a holding period conducting some workshops with targeted stakeholders um, at the direction of some of the board members um, and really just starting the, the policy development and the planning process. Um, and so if anyone has any thoughts they want to share um, with, with me on that, feel free to shoot me an email or just put it in the chat and I can incorporate that into to our outreach um, and in the public comment. Um, but we are planning to go back October 26th, I believe is our next board of supervisors workshop where we're going to come back and kind of present some of our findings from data that they've asked us to collect um, and get hopefully more policy direction at that point. Okay, thank you. Robert, can we, I know we had talked in the past about having a, a special meeting with the members of the forest working group to um, hear a presentation from you on those ordinances and, and have a discussion. Is it still feeling like a good time to do something like that or would you like to maybe uh, wait until after October? Um, no, I think, I think, yeah, we can definitely still do that this summer. Um, I, I'm having a meeting with my, my project manager after, after this meeting, kind of to discuss like what we are gonna do for outreach this summer. Um, and so I definitely think um, we'd like to do something with this group. Um, you know, so I think several of you were at the Farm Bureau listening session we had, and it would be very similar, I think, to that kind of just uh, present what we have currently um, and then get feedback on what what's working, what's not working, things like that. That sounds great. Okay, thank listen, you. Listen, next month, we're going to add something to this general update, so it won't take much time. But um, we want to uh, ask you guys, as you make your presentations of what you're doing is, how could the forest working group support you? So uh, we really want to you know, get in information of how we can be more effective. So I'm just going to add that. All right. So um, I think that on back on the agenda, check in. On, hello, did I miss somebody? Okay. So um, 
back on the agenda number one, funding opportunities, we really did uh, hear a lot of funding opportunities. So I don't think we need to go over the CAL FIRE grants. And I don't think we need to do the pg e settlement funds unless Kim thinks there's something key we need to know now. And the fledgling fund and the catalyst fund are um, funding, funding proposals that Adriana and I have out for funding uh, Adriana's uh, continued work with us. So I don't think we need to do more than that. I think they're very positive. I think we will get some funding very soon. So that's good. But Fred, maybe you can give us an update about uh, community uh, foundations uh, uh, opportunities that may come up uh, for funding. Um, uh, I have not received anything from them for a little while, except that they're still paying attention to us. And um, I got to leave it right there. Okay. 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 Well, we'll keep it on the agenda. Yeah. Um, and I have nothing more on the North Bay Foundation, but we'll keep it on in case something pops up. All right. So now we have a steering committee report um, of, of five minutes. And uh, Kim, are you able to, to take that on? Yes, Dee. I wanted to interject one other thing about the funding. Um, one of the things that the committee uh, struggled with were a variety of different uh, communities in the western part of the county. Um, obviously, a high uh, fire risk, um, but none of the communities uh, met the CEQA uh, compliance. Um, that, uh, and so the board is uh, going to be receiving um, recommendations to proceed with a, um, a Cal VTP process to try to encompass all those communities in that area. Um, there was a remaining uh, $300,000 uh, for uh, Permit Sonoma to manage that uh, Cal TP, VTP process uh, so those communities could address their fire concerns. So I just want to share that with the, with the larger group. Thank you. Uh, Thank now you. going on to the uh, two-year two work plan activities. Uh, one of the things that uh, we discussed in our um, steering committee meeting was to uh, determine how to go about the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts within um, the working group. So um, we're familiar with a couple of examples of different organizations uh, addressing issues of uh, DEI. And we'd like to get your feedback on ways in which our uh, group, uh, as eclectic as we are, how do we include a greater opportunities for inclusion, um, improve our diversity as far as uh, the different ethnic groups that uh, are present in the county, uh, and make sure that there's a degree of equity for folks who are uh, within the county who uh, either work in the forest industry or manage forest lands uh, and whatever the case might be. So um, next steps, uh, typically these types of things uh, go to a subcommittee uh, for people who are interested in addressing specific issue. So I would uh, encourage us to send an email or and maybe we take a, a straw poll now about people who are interested in trying to address this within the organization. Adriana, do you have any suggestions on how best to address that? Well, I think um, I think at our last meeting we had I had heard some things from people saying that they um, weren't so much interested frozen in having a. Yeah, I'm frozen. Okay. Uh, well, I think what you asked was good. Is there are there people interested in having a a, a discussion between now and the next meeting uh, about how? I think she uh, got kicked out of the meeting, so I think she's back though. Okay, so anybody else? It'd be great to have one more um, volunteer. I'm willing, I'm willing to help. We, we've done a lot of that with the organizations that I've been part of. Okay, thank you very much. And there was one other person that was talking about having their uh, a women's outreach program, and I don't recall who that was. 
Are they still on the line? I would pray. This would be a good conversation that we can bring back to the next meeting. So that would be great. Thank you. Uh, we're running, you know, we've got to be done by 1130 so we can hear the open space district. So let's keep moving through this. Um, Brianna, is Brianna here to give us an update on the um, JC program or anybody else that knows about it? Okay. Opportunities uh, to reduce local forest land conversion to non-forest uh, landscapes. Are we putting this off? Uh, oh, I guess we're hearing, we're thinking we'd like to hear from um, about this issue in July. Is that uh, what we'd like to do as part of the agenda? I think that sounds good. Okay, so Adriana, why don't you just, you know, put that on the agenda for July. So now we have um, ideas. Uh, about what other topics we want to, to cover this year. And we've gone, so here's the list and I'm gonna go over them very briefly. Uh, we did talk about the forest landowner boot camp, So I think we're good with that for now, unless one of you wants to say something that you didn't say before. All right, so then um, Pre-fire forest management project tours. Uh, apparently there's a number of options for um, going on and about. Maybe, is there someone else that knows more about this particular item that wants to take on this uh, discussion? Adriana, are you? Yeah, if you guys can hear me, um, sorry for my bad connection. I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm just really glad that the whole meeting didn't get crashed <laughs> because of it. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So this was just a list that we had started um, thinking about different sites we might visit to look at pre-fire treatments. And we tagged a couple, you know, we tagged people who we thought might be um, hosts, not that we've actually confirmed with them that they would like to, just brain, we're brainstorming. So um, yeah, just going over the list really quick. We have, um, a, a, you know, possibly a tour of the PUC, which Peter has um, um, agreed to to host us, and we're just kind of looking for a time to make that happen. So thanks, Peter. Um, when you're super busy, so hopefully we can make something work, but we'll see. Um, we have a, you know, possible tour of Calabasas Preserve. Um, which we've heard from, from Kim um, about in the past. Sounds really interesting. Would be great to see what's happening there. Um, there's interest in going out to the state parks and looking at the fuels management that they're working on on the coast. Um, regional parks is recovering um, from fire in, in numerous parks. Um, Sonoma Valley Regional Park might be a good site to look at. Um, I spoke to Melanie Parker um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and, and she's super excited to share some of the ac uh, activities that they're involved with as far as fuel management and also recovery post fire on the glass fire, uh, such as up at Hood Mountain um, and Sonoma Valley Regional Park. Um, it seems like there was an opportunity to go and visit that particular area and maybe hit a couple of projects together, uh, such as Calabasas, uh, Sonoma Valley Regional Park, Good, uh, as well as the work that's being done by uh, Boobery Preserve, as well as uh, uh, SLT. So uh, those are things that we can kind of think geographically and that might apply. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think it'd be awesome to see those. Um, kind of moving in a different direction is the monitoring work um, Pepperwood Preserve is doing in there. Um, mm -hmm burned areas, which is, <laughs> I don't know exactly where that is on the preserve, but a lot of it has burned. So there's a lot of land to look at um, as Devin was describing. Um, and then thinking about private properties, small rural properties, um, what permaculture artisans has been doing in the realm of pre-fire out there. Um, so we might reach out to them to hear their perspective. Um, and then there's some interest in, in looking at a site that's, that's doing biochar or otherwise util utilizing their forest debris. So um, 
Oh, and then and then finally looking at um, tribal property and the work that they're doing. So this is just a, a list of, of possibilities. And I think what we're hoping or what I'm hoping will happen is that um, some, you know, some members from the group will get excited about one of these and want to connect with the, um, you know, a contact who can make it happen. Um, sometimes that's me, um, but my time has been um, limited by my limited funding. So if anyone wants to volunteer to help coordinate one of these, that would be really great. Any takers, <laughs> any volunteers that would offer to organize such a tour that we've had several tours over the last uh, couple of years and they've been very helpful, informative, successful, and, and intimate, actually. You really get some time you know, uh, together <laughs> in, in the field. Uh, so anybody have a um, Yeah, I'll take the lead on the um, uh, Sonoma Valley efforts. And maybe I can work with Ellie and Sonoma uh, Ecology Center uh, to set up a tour that would uh, hit a couple of different properties. Um, it will be a little bit logistically challenging and timing is of the essence as far as, I'm not sure if we can pull it off pre-fire season, but maybe um, push it back uh, maybe six months down the road uh, where it's a little bit uh, less of a threat and it'd be a good experience for everybody to see it during the wintertime. Yeah, I'd be happy to work with you on that, Kim. And, and also um, SEC is doing a lot of work with biochar um, we have these kilns that uh, are portable. They're being used up in Mendocino uh, for some grant funded projects up there, but I think they're back in town. Um, obviously, we're not going to be burning anything right now, but we could, <laughs> you know, we could do something or that might have to wait until uh, rainy season. But we can definitely make that happen. Even on my property, actually, I have some something. I have stuff to burn. Oh, well, that sounds great. And I've, I've, yeah, I've already arranged to use the kilns, so. And what, what time of year were you going to do that? Well, it would have to be once things are damp, you know, sometime in probably November. Okay, so we have two for later in the year. Is anyone wanting to, and we don't have to, so I'm just saying, but is there somebody that's interested in taking a lead on one, um, you know, over the summer? If not, we'll just put it on the agenda again. No problem, and we're, we're, we'll be good. But thanks. You know, I don't. I don't. Um, excuse me for interrupting. I don't want to overcommit myself because I've been um, ri ridiculously busy. But I'm very interested in seeing what permaculture artisans has done. Um, you know, and I'm. I've. You know, so I could check in with them. I have a. I have a connection with them. But if you could tell me who at their organization you've been in touch with then I can, oh, Matt, <laughs> duh. Yeah, so I can do that. I can follow up with Matt. That would be great. He's fantastic. Um, and we- oh, it, Adriana well. looks like she is already connecting with Eric, but maybe Matt would be a quicker connection. Yeah, I think we should let Adriana go on that one because she has uh, you know, limited time right now. And as you know, she's going to go back to school school uh, in September, although she's going to continue to work for, with us, for sure, we we need to, you know, be more careful of her time. So I'd say, Ellie, if you would work with Matt on that would be great. Okay. Thanks and I think we're going to, go ahead. I was just saying thanks, and I'm happy to, to support um, connecting Ellie with, with Matt or Eric. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've already been in touch with Matt on another subject, so. Great. Anything else on this, um, the tours? And so Adriana, are you gonna at least initially talk to, the, to those that have volunteered and do a little coordination with them so that they can get to be the leader, but you know, just with a little orientation and help with scheduling? Yeah, definitely. Okay. okay, good. So now we have um, item C, which I'm gonna postpone, I want to um, touch bases with the agricultural community and their forests because they have uh, fantastic forests f uh, around their vineyards and I'm working on it, but it's going slowly. So we'll just keep it on the agenda. So Ellie, did you wanna do anything on the fuels management in various habitats or should we just put that over for next time? No, just, I don't need to do anything in particular, but while folks are 
it sounds to me like the um, the the base camp might be dealing with this. And and I you know I I talked earlier about how there was a lot of enthusiasm among the fire safe councils and and other groups. And um, maybe we need to just funnel this through the JC. Um, uh -huh. So I'd be really interested in finding out what what Fred or Jill or um, forgetting her name with the JC would uh -huh. would uh, how, how we should follow up on this. Like like are you thinking as part of the boot camp? Um, uh... I'm I'm yeah I'm raising that question to uh, to see if Fred okay. is uh, Fred is here. Fred is here. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. Yep. Um, anyway, uh, the the boot camp we are we are looking at several ways to get it funded, but apparently it can um, be a uh, a project as a community class because the JC is all designed for having community classes. So we're looking at um, 10 classes uh, at around 50 or to $100 a piece and sort of following the, um, the model that we have already set up and that UCANR has set up. And what was your offer, Ellie? Um, to integrate our um, biological, you know, our, our uh, ecological approaches, you know, through your classes and maybe even, you know, helping train people to do fire fuels assessment in a way that recognizes the, the, the sensitivity of the environment. I think that would be great. And in fact, we'll be calling on a lot of the people on this call and elsewhere to get you to um, do an hour or so of, of the boot camp so that people get different perspectives on their forests. And so Ellie, I will be directly in touch with you for that, okay? Okay, perfect. Okay. Terrific. And we talked with Robert about the tree ordinance, and I think we had uh, covered that. Unless Robert, you have anything more you want to say about it? We're doing okay, good on time. Good. Okay, so future agenda items. Um, we. Oh, I have something to say about that. I did. Um, I did reach out to Marshall Turboville and Ben Nichols, and um, they would be happy to present in July with a. Oh outlook for the summer 2021 fire season excellent in july fantastic exactly. but we still don't have anything for august or september so if there's um topics that people want to hear about please refer to that linked list and kind of cast your vote um or if there's anything that we talked about at this meeting that's just like feeling really juicy for you that you want to hear more about next you know in in the coming months uh, let me know and we'll try and line something up. I've been really, I've been really liking having a presenter at every one of our meetings. Um, it feels like such a great value add to our time. So I'd like yes, to- Yes, yes. And, and as you, as for those that don't know, it's a 30 minute presentation at the end of our uh, ag agenda and they've been really popular and it, it, it brings new people in because of the interest on, on all the topics that we choose. So we'll, I'm sure we'll have a huge number of people in July <laughs> and uh, the steering committee can work uh, in between now and July about what's gonna happen in August and September. But if anyone has ideas like J. Adriana is saying, you know, um, either speak up now or, you know, get in touch with uh, Adriana about it um, when you want to. All right. So I think uh, maybe uh, does one of you wonderful open space district folks want to take over at this point for the for the presentation? Oh, wait, you know what? We uh, got uh, Susan Hayden that hasn't, uh, hasn't given a, a little update from the district. So can we do that from the uh, agent, water agency? Susan, you wanna give a quick what, you, what you've been up to and what you want to help, have help with or something? Oh, goodness, thank you, Dee. Um, I don't have a, um, fine. Fine. a big update, uh, but I'll just say a couple of things. Um, regarding funding and state budget and so forth, uh, it might be a great idea that when something, when we're a little more solid on the state budget and funding opportunities, 
maybe it's August or September thereafter that um, I'm happy to come back and, and share what I know. Uh, would be good to convene, especially to hear from CAL FIRE. And um, I just want to, two cents in um, biochar or kiln related um, field visit, I think would be awesome. And I'd be happy to help work with Raymond and other folks at SEC to bring something together. Um, and also just mention that uh, many of our tribal partners are doing some great work and there might be opportunities uh, down the road there. So, well, that uh, would be, I'm, I'm wondering if you're talking about a tour or a presentation. Uh, do you? I guess I'm talking about a, a, a tour, an in, in field okay. demonstration. Great. Yeah. Great. And I think as, as COVID restrictions and as we move forward into time, there's going to be more um, tours and, you know, in person. Uh, field visits offered by a number of different groups. And I think whether it's forest working group hosted or another group hosts, we just wanna be in close coordination so that forest working group members can, can uh, take advantage of those opportunities, so. Yes, and also I think to coordinate so there aren't too many tours, you know, that uh, are conflict with particular dates or something. So how would we do that? Coordinating, I think our monthly meetings we can and okay. and our listserv, uh, the listserv is really helpful with uh, okay. being able to coordinate with members in between our meetings. Okay, that sounds great, Darren. Thank you, thank you. So with That's that, all. is there anyone else uh, that wanted to um, say anything before the district does their beautiful presentation? <laughs> okay, Kim, are you the guy? I'm the guy for right now, anyway, yes. <laughs> I'll launch this anyway. Well, thank you folks for giving us the opportunity to uh, present uh, to you today uh, our Vital Lands Initiative. We wanted to basically give you an update and share with you some of the uh, data that went into this process. And also thank you for your contributions to uh, the, the public input part of our uh, process here. Um, I have today with us uh, uh, Misty Audius, our new general manager, which we're all very excited about. Uh, Allison Schicktel is our senior conservation planner, and Alex Young are, is our conservation GIS coordinator. And so each of us will provide you uh, with an overview of what Vital Lands uh, Initiative is all about, a little uh, background information about the um, the uh, Ag and Open Space and Vital Lands as a whole. Um, Alex is going to present to you the uh, interactive map uh, demo. So you have a chance to play around with the tools that are going to be available on our website. Uh, we'll discuss what the Vital Lands Network is, is and address exactly how Vital Lands is uh, related to forest protection here in Sonoma County. And finally, we'll end with a, a case study on uh, Weeks Ranch. It kind of gives you a sense of what role we can play with landowners who have a conservation easement across their property. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Misty Arias to uh, lead us in a discussion about exactly what uh, Vital Lands Initiative is. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I um. I was looking at the attendees and I'm thinking I might rein in the way these first few slides are drafted because they're they're more, you know, basic of information about our organization. I think many of you are really familiar with us. So I might I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I might skim through like the history of our organization. But some of our fun facts uh, are that we are now just our organization is at over 122,000 acres of protected land throughout the county, which is about 12%. Um, if you all are, so I'll leave, you can like zoom through the slides, Kim, just as I'm talking and folks can pay attention. Okay. To I might, I'm going to be so off script. I think I've just decided. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I know many of you are probably paying attention to the fact that uh, the, the president of the U.S. and the governor of California have both started calling for land conservation efforts in order to support nature-based solutions for climate resiliency and those goals are in the 30 percent by 2030 range if if you look at the work that we have done to date and in partnership with our other nonprofit and public agency partners 
our county is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%. And so we have a lot of work to do. Um, luckily, the voters in Sonoma County were generous in approving the local sales tax measure, which you're all, I'm sure, keenly aware of. There's some information on our screen about that expenditure plan and how it helps us fund land conservation efforts. But I think having, we're in an amazing moment in Sonoma County in that we have this incredible plan you'll hear a little bit more about. We have local funding, um, significant local funding to help draw additional resources to help meet some of these really aggressive land conservation goals. We have decided to use conservation easements. There's a slide up here now that you can see as our primary tool for land conservation land conservation efforts. I'm sure most of you are familiar with easements, but just to say that one of the main reasons we focus on easements, this was a, decided from the very beginning in the early 90s, is because they're less expensive up front to acquire. So we can make much greater impact across the landscape and ensuring more acres of land are not impacted or converted to different uses outside of natural habitat or agricultural land or other types of open space. And also they're even more significantly less expensive to um, steward in the long term or in perpetuity. So I know there's some land management folks on um, in this Zoom who know very well how expensive it is to care for land and we don't bear the burden of those costs. So we reserve much more of the funding available moving forward to protect more acres locally. I think you can move on, yeah. So, um, we're just, we're incredibly excited as a, as a staff. We have been kind of, we keep joking, we've been slowing down our on the ground outcomes uh, while we did this important work with the community to develop the Vital Lands Initiative. Like Kim thanked all of you, many of you had incredible input into this process. We believe strongly that the Vital Lands Initiative reflects the values of our community. We put out ideas, we heard lots of feedback, we made adjustments. And it, it is our roadmap moving forward. You'll hear a lot more about the specifics, but we could use the data information within Vital Lands to help us set um, forward thinking objectives that are measurable. We are intending to go after highest priority areas and working with folks like yourselves and identifying gaps for land conservation, for for fire and climate resiliency, for biodiversity protection. I don't know if anybody saw that article in the New York Times recently about ensuring that we are looking carefully at biodiversity in relationship to climate resiliency and not just focusing on climate change itself. I think that's a, a key um, place for our organization to focus and you'll hear more about that from Allison and Alex. Um, we are really excited to be working with um, all of our land conservation partners and experts in particular types of habitats and land management scenarios like yourselves to identify where we're going to have the greatest impact and highly prioritize and get strategic about the efforts that we're going to be um, hopefully all together accomplishing on the ground. And um, the thing I, staff and I have been talking about, all of us have been talking about recently that we're so excited about is that we have projections for revenue. There are going to be federal and state resources. I think our local sales tax dollars will be a draw for those resources. And um, it's just an incredible time to be in this line of work and to be engaging with folks like yourselves to see if we can make, meet some of these aggressive goals for ensuring that there's at least 30% of the land throughout Sonoma County conserved for you know, biodiversity, survival of natural systems and humankind. <laughs> so um, I will turn it over to Allison at this moment. And just, um, I want to say that I will, at 12, I do have to run. So I'm gonna stay on, but if you guys run a little over, I, I, I'm sorry, I'll have to hop off because I'm presenting at an ag day for Leadership Santa Rosa. So I'm going from climate, forest, ag, which is the best part of our work is the diversity. So. Um, Allison, I'll turn it over to you and I'm happy to help answer questions and such as we move on. Thank you. Thank for you having me. Thanks, Missy. So I wanted to speak um, just briefly about some of the tools that Ag and Open Space staff and our partners are using as we're looking to implement Vital Lands Initiative. Uh, we did a lot of work and received input from the community, from content experts, um, from folks like yourselves um, to gather as much information as we can about 
the landscape across Sonoma County, looking at um, multiple facets of our work. So um, updating data sets related to vegetation communities and croplands through the Sonoma VegMap program, um, refining our information about hyd hydro hydrologic systems. So more fine scale information about the precise location of stream center lines. We've done some floodplain and riparian mapping. Um, and so incorporating and um, some synthesizing this information into the Vital Lands Initiative report, which you may have seen, we've identified these mapped priorities. Um, so sort of specific uh, areas uh, or conservation benefits across the landscape that we're seeking to protect. Um, you know, some of this information has also included uh, metrics about forest structure, including a ladder fuels layer that I think was shared um, with this group in the past and has certainly been incorporated into the work that Pepperwood Preserve is doing to do fuels um, modeling and fire hazard maps. So all this is to say um, Vital Lands Initiative, a, a huge component of the work in developing the plan itself was to update kind of our inventory um, about uh, information on the landscape so that we can um, hone in and be um, informed from at least an initial desktop exercise to identify where are these most important places to protect um, in the county. So I wanted to note that these data inform all facets of ag and open spaces work. Um, certainly we can use this information from an acquisition perspective to identify areas that are important to protect that aren't currently um, protected by an easement or, or held um, in fee by one of our partners, but also to note that this information will be used to inform how we structure our easements. What are the terms of the easements? Um, things like defining the extent of a riparian protection area along a stream, where you're sort of moving this information along to say, this is an important place to protect, and now how can we use this map um, with our staff and with a landowner to designate um, certain areas within a conservation easement that are worthy of kind of additional protections. And we also use this information from a stewardship perspective to enforce the terms of the easement to make sure that the conservation values that are identified in the easement are protected forever. So this is sort of these data and the information and in vital lands are kind of one, one element um, part of our toolkit for um, permanent protection of these properties. And so I um, just, just generally um, wanted to share how we're using the data that are captured in the report, but also it's really important to Ag and Open Space uh, and our partners that we make the information that we're using um, to make informed decisions about land conservation available to the public and others. And so we've put together an interactive map that should be uh, made live to the public very soon. We've got just like one final change to make and then it'll, it'll go live. But today Alex is gonna give a brief demo of the interactive map um, in the hopes that you can get familiar with it, see what's available to you. Um, and then once it's live, you can start playing with the data yourself to see um, you know, where are there areas where there's multiple benefits um, that might be, uh, you know, a, an important place for us to protect. So Alex is going to give a quick demo. Alex, you're still on. Yep. There you go. Got it. Thanks. I'm uh, just going to share my screen here, and um, let's see, is it coming up? Here we go. Can everyone see that? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so this is the interactive map. Um, so if I refresh this, um, you'll see it. it uh, you come, come to the website. Um, this is the first thing you'll see. The map builds itself, and then you get this welcome screen that kind of gives you a little bit of an intro to navigating the website. Um, so we have widgets. Um, and these all um, correspond to a different Vital Lands Initiative category, and the data that's associated with those is, um, is uh, associated with the widget. Um, there's also, you can switch up uh, where the data layers are, where the legend is, base map information, and I'll run you through all of this. 
So and just, Alex, uh, can I, uh, in, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to remind you that the focus of this group is the forest work that this Vital Lands Initiative uh, is going to, uh, you know, increase the conservation of. So whenever you can use an example for forests in your, in your presentation, I'd really think that would be very valuable. Thank you. Okay, sure. And I'll, I'll run through um, some of, you know, the different layers that we have in here and the forest is definitely part of that. Um, so, uh, so the first thing you come to is the, the main page here, and you can see that the legend is already populated. Uh, what I have up here is the um, Ag and Open Space Protected Land and other protected lands throughout the county. And the first thing you can do is click on them and you get information. If it's an Ag and Open Space property, you get a good description of it and uh, a nice photo. You can click on and it, it gets larger and, and you can you know, have a nice view of the property. Um, if it's a non-ag and open space property, you click on it and you get um, whatever the name of the property is and, and whatever access it is if you own it. Um, the, um, the widgets, I'll run you through those. And so um, Dee, you asked about uh, forests. And so um, here under wildlands, so each of these corresponds to a different um, vital lands initiative. So we have ag lands, community identity, healthy communities, water, and wildlands. And so uh, since you asked about forests, I'll check on this one first. And so we can open that up. You can move your widgets around um, and we can click on and find where the priority conifer forests are throughout the county, where the priority shrublands are, where we have priority hardwood forests. And then you can zoom around and you can move in, move the map around and you can start to see how ag and open space existing properties uh, protect these priority habitats. Um, we also have, we have everything that's in the Vital Lands Initiative in this map. So it's a nice viewer for all of the data in one place. You can always click on the home button to get back to the original screen. Um, we have uh, several views that you can do. You can look at all of your data layers in one single table of contents list. You can uh, open up a legend. You can change the base map. If you wanted imagery in the background, you can just pop that on, zoom in. If you wanted to look at something like Taylor Mountain, for example, and you said, um, what values does this have? And you look here and you say, well, um, it, it's got existing public access. It's got, it's in a priority green belt area. It's in a highly visible landscape. It's also got priority hardwoods. It's got priority grasslands. And so we can start to see like um, how uh, existing properties line up, um, mm -hmm. but you can start to see how this tool could be used to stack up these different layers and start to identify places where, um, where conservation would be key. Allison, did you have something to add? No, that's great. Thanks, Alex. Okay. It's a great, great. Um, initial great. overview. Any questions? Yeah, that's great, Alex. Thanks very much. And I think the value of this map for a lot of people will be to just zero in on your community and really get a sense as to what are the important conservation values that we've researched and placed on these maps. I think it will be really amazing uh, to see uh, exactly what uh, types of data are available for your specific area. So I think that's going to be a huge value for folks on uh, the Forest Working Group to see exactly what are the connections between different uh, riparian areas, um, wildlife corridors, and things like that. I have a, a, a question, Alex. Sure. Uh, are there other um, areas that are using your same format uh, presentation and you know the layer, the way you've presented this? Uh, so the web map is a tool that many people are using, but this one's customized for um, Vital Lands Initiative. It looks pretty good All to right. me. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Alex. We really appreciate it. 
I just I have a question. Uh, yeah. When when you're looking at priority hardwood or priority conifer or priority any sort of ecology, what makes that a priority? Because it sort of looks like when you hit grassland, like it was everything that was grassland. <laughs> Uh, I can, uh, I can share a good. little bit more about um, any specifics, um, but in generally the vegetation communities, the priorities, um, some of them, so you see a lot of grassland, a lot of them are considered low priority because um, they may not be dominated by natives. Um, certainly native grasslands where they've been mapped have been identified as highest priority. Um, but most of the vegetation communities, including the shrublands, hardwoods, and conifers, are based off of either local rarity um, or state rarity vulnerability based off of threat. Um, that's been tracked and informed by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They have a designation for each vegetation community that we've adopted and incorporated. Um, and where there are certain communities that are especially locally rare or or we feel are th particularly threatened, then those have been mapped um, as higher priority than what maybe CDFW has designated across the state. So we're, we're really folding in um, information that comes from a, a statewide assessment of, of those communities. Awesome. I think it made a lot more sense too when you clicked on that particular grassland and you were zoomed out to the entire county rather than <laughs> when it was a little closer in there you can kind of see like as you were going yeah, south see, like, where the really high priority ones are and the others are just there's grassland there and it's priority but maybe lower priority i see thank you very much sure. all right uh brooke do you have a quick question yeah uh alex or allison um is this just uh, an interactive kind of data viewer or is there going to be a way to um, upload like a parcel layer or uh, a project area that's delineated as a shape file and then uh, upload that to this map server and, and download some of that information? No, this, is a, this is a viewer. Okay. Yeah, our, our current intention is just to have it as a viewer. Um, and, and we may, you know, make uh, something like a, a report generator for internal use and um, whether or not that could be made public is sort of a, a TBD, <laughs> but that would be great. Thanks. Uh, hey, Brooke, one, one idea might be to consider the conservation uh, land network, uh, that those tools are very much geared towards providing you the, the best resources uh, available for a parcel of land. Um, they obviously they uh, have degrees of concern about people's privacy and information, but uh, that tool is really phenomenal to be able to to roll into this. And that's something that uh, Allison uh, can share a little bit about what we're doing with the conservation land network. Network. Great. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Allison, would you like to go on this slide or where would you like to return? Oh, let me uh, stop sharing. Figure out where my... Okay, great. I, can you see my screen now? Yep, got it. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'll speak um, briefly and then Alex or uh, Alex Kim is going to share um, some information from a stewardship perspective. So as you can see in the interactive map and in the Vital Lands Initiative report, um, Vital Lands sets these kind of broad brush, um, really ambitious goals where we've identified that are areas that are important for protection. We're interested in protecting high priority hardwoods as an example. We're interested in protecting old growth mature conifer forests, um, but there's a lot of high priority areas out there that are um, really important to protect. And we know that we have limited time, we have limited funding, and if we're going to be in alignment with the 30% by 30, you know, all the more work for us to do in the next nine years. Um, and so where we're at now with Vital Lands Initiative is um, we're in the process of taking all of the objectives, the map priorities and strategies and um, forming an, an actionable plan. So we're um, using this information to identify uh, more refined areas where we can be most efficient in achieving our goals. So looking at where where's our overlap 
um, where we can achieve multiple benefits. We're using this information to develop outreach strategies for landowners. So as an example for forest lands, uh, if we set an ambitious target of protecting 90% of old growth conifer forests by 2030, um, we can measure sort of where we're at in achieving that target um, and then identify specific properties where we may reach out to a landowner um, and express interest um, in working with them to protect the, those specific conservation values on their property. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. I did want to share one specific sort of tool or approach that we're taking called that we're calling the Vital Lands Network that will help us uh, I develop those targets, develop uh, priority areas where we can really be focused and strategic in our efforts. Um, and these networks are based off of sort of four main themes that tier from the goals and vital lands initiative. Um, and they include biodiversity, agriculture, which includes croplands and grazing lands, green belts as part of a community identity goal and groundwater really focused on water supply. So if Kim, you can go to the next slide. Can I uh -huh. ask a question? Um, so if um, a group, one of us, one of our groups wanted to see where in the county are the old growth forests, mm -hmm. right? is that something that's gonna be publicly available to see? Yeah, that we've included um, what I would call an old growth mature forest proxy, uh, not ground truth layer in the vital lands, the interactive map. Uh, those have been indicated as highest priority. So they show up as dark green on the map. Um, so you should be able to identify those areas. And we would love to hear from you if we missed the mark on, on any locations, whether there's something that's underrepresented or overrepresented in that category. But yep, those data And what are about different. riparian forests? Is that something that is a category that could be looked at? Because it's such a critical, um, critical habitat. Those actually, this example that uh, Allison's showing uh, does involve uh, riparian areas. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm just yeah. curious how detail, you know, because people want to know these things so they can know where to work. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes, riparian. So there's a riparian layer, and um, it's the designated as areas that are uh, have natural or native forested vegetation and then areas that have non-native or are in cultivation. So there's sort of that distinguishment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So just to share one new and exciting tool that we're using that's hot off the presses and we'll look forward to sharing more um, is this Vital Lands Network approach. It's very similar to the Conservation Lands Network. If folks are familiar with that, the same methodology was employed here where we look across the landscape, um, Vital Lands Initiative, through that process, we identified priority areas. And now we're using a software program called MarkSan to um, identify where on the landscape we can uh, achieve the goals that are set forth in Vital Lands where we're protecting those priority uh, areas in the most efficient strategic way. Um, and so what you're seeing on the screen now is an example of a biodiversity network where we fed in all of the, the shrublands, hardwoods, conifers, grasslands data from Vital Lands um, and asked of the software program um, if we were to protect 90% of the highest priority vegetation communities, 75% of the second highest and 50% of the third tier, uh, where, where should we be doing this on the landscape um, in a manner that both sort of takes advantage of current protected areas and looks for opportunities to protect adjacent to that, but also um, to develop this broader network. Um, so the output, what you're seeing here um, is, is really focused on vegetation communities and ensuring that uh, across all of Sonoma County, um, we're, we're looking to achieve um, uh, a protection of, of high priority vegetation communities. So blue areas would be considered essential to meeting conservation goals. Those are the first priority for us um, to 
to really look into as an opportunity for conservation. And then in the teal, the kind of like the feathery edges um, would be in important to meeting conservation goals. So there's still some benefit there. There's likely still some priority vegetation communities, um, but it might not be the most efficient um, area to protect. Now, will we be able to see this type of map uh, when we go to, to um you know, hunt around <laughs> in your, in, in this program? Um, current discussions are that we'll be using this information to inform our internal uh, strategies and priorities, but we're not intending to make this specific map public. But we could go in and look at it, you know, at some point, which just, it wouldn't be right on the website. Uh, maybe Misty can speak more about, um, how we'll approach sharing with partners, but it, I know it won't be on the interactive. Yeah, it's funny. We just, um, we this work is like literally hot off the presses. Allison uh, and Alex and a team of folks, we were working with Tom Robinson Consulting and got these products last week. So um, we were, we, we're working with them to help drive our efforts. Like Allison suggested, we haven't talked all the way through. Um, we usually really love to be an open book with data and sharing information with folks. So um, the source data is all going to be available as it typically is. This is, we have developed criteria of our own to help drive some of our decision-making. So I think we need to think through about exactly how that does, how this data and the networks get shared publicly, but we'll definitely have that conversation and follow up. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And you can always come and talk to us about these things. We're just having to balance the whole willing seller, scaring off landowners, high landowner expectations with maps that go public of what our highest priorities are. All of the real estate folks get super nervous if folks are aware that their property is a priority for us, which I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. But yeah. to know where the important lands are, it doesn't have yeah. to be that we know what the, your priorities are, but if we totally. can see what, where the important lands are, then we can assess, you know, Absolutely. Uh, and that's what I want to know, not necessarily your priorities, but how do we determine ours? And right, so I you're think saying, yeah, I think that's the kind of data we're willing to share, right? Like here's high priority types of habitat uh -huh. or okay. vegetation types, no problem. And then what Allison's sharing with you right now is us refining those based on our own criteria to right. the priorities we'll be setting up. Okay, thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, and, I have a question. Again, it's important to emphasize that, um, as Misty said, we absolutely work in partnership. And part of the uh, value of going through our VLI process it was the public input. And so we tried to roll all that information in and present with you a map representing the whole county. And so uh, while we don't go down to the absolute parcel level because we're trying to protect uh, privacy, we do want input from y'all for uh, the accuracy that we're coming up with these priorities. And so that was mentioned by uh, Allison. Allison, do you want to continue on with the climate change? Sure. Yeah, Can I'll I try to question. Okay, go ahead, Jen. Gina. Hi, real quick. Um, when you were talking about CEs as your primary tool, uh, you mentioned it's less expensive to manage and that you don't bear the burden of those costs. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, uh, who's bearing the burden and who's managing the CEs? Yeah, I'm sorry. What I meant is that we don't have to manage the land. We are responsible for stewarding, monitoring, and enforcing the terms of the conservation easements to make sure the landowners are managing and operating and using their land consistent with easement terms, but that's a fraction of the cost of if we were actually managing the land ourselves. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Of course. Yeah, sorry if I said that confusing. I'd like to jump in real quick. Uh, do you guys do anything to help promote or support the uh, critical fire mitigation work on these priority landscapes that you guys are identifying here as priorities to conserve? Yeah, I, actually, that's uh, one of the things that we are talking about um, enhancing in our work is so we do already provide resources to landowners because we have relationships with over 300 different landowners and um in there if there are regions that have something of critical importance to us we share resources we are trying to get more proactive in encouraging land management strategies that are beneficial to climate resiliency and fire adaptation so um 
it's something that we, I think that we can continue to improve upon if we have information or techniques, or if there's an effort in a region, like we, we belong to the Cinema Valley Fire Collaborative and whatever we're learning through that process, we are sharing that information. Our easements to date do not mandate particular types of land management approaches. So we're trying to figure out ways to um, share information and encourage uh, management of land that minimizes fire risk and enhances biodiversity and natural benefit. Careful and hard balance to find, I'm sure you understand. Um, but that's that's the level that we're at today, but I do think it's something we want to continue to explore. Sure. And well, I know I that's, that's kind of the creation of this team, right? Was like, how do you take it a step further? So. Sure. That's a good strategy you guys have of pursuing more conservation easements and fewer fee simple acquisitions because then you're not responsible for as much land. The Land Trust of Napa County is putting an emphasis on fee simple acquisition and now they're facing pressure to do something about fire mitigation work. So I like how you guys are dealing with that. So it's a lot. It's a lot. Hey, we did the same thing. We learned from our own experience. We owned 7,500 acres of land and learned the hard way. Yeah. Exactly right. what that entails. Well, yeah. Keep up the good work. Well, Misty, thank you very much for your participation. We know you need to go off to your other presentations. Good so, to see you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bye -bye. And folks, it's 12 noon, so uh, we will continue uh, with the presentation. But we recognize that other people have other obligations. We'll hope you'll stay with us for a little bit longer. I think we could probably wrap up in the next 10 or 15 minutes. OK, Allison? Sure, I'll just speak briefly. Um, there's a, a map here that shows landscape resilience, but I did want to note that as Ag and Open Space is looking at these vital lands networks and other information that we've mapped through Vital Lands Initiative, we are in addition looking at um, where these areas that are mapped as high priority are also important to protect through the lens of climate change resiliency and also looking sort of complementary at extreme events, looking at fires and floods to ensure um, if we're protecting a property, there's also benefits through the lens of landscape connectivity. So ensuring that there's areas um, for wildlife movement or um, sort of native species migration in the face of climate change. We're looking at landscape diversity, specifically topographic diversity, where we've got variations um, in topography, north facing, south facing slopes, wetted areas um, that can serve as refugia for um, uh, in the future for um, warmer temperatures, drier areas. Um, and then sort of culminating this information, there's a landscape resilience layer that the Nature Conservancy has generated um, that identifies areas that will be um, important to protect um, in the future um, because they, they support landscape connectivity because um, they uh, house a number of refugia areas. So we're using this information kind of as an overlay um, with our map priorities through Vital Lands Initiative to make sure that um, any and all of our conservation efforts also have benefits through the lens of climate change. Um, and we're using separate data um, to look at fire risk reduction as well. We, we know that our work um, by reducing the number of uh, development rights on, on land can have huge benefits for protecting communities um, from fire risk, but taking that one step further to look at where are there high fire hazard areas and what could be the potential role of land conservation and reducing development in those areas. So that's kind of an example of an additional overlay where we have conservation values that um, were really driven by community input um, and our initial expenditure plan focused on natural systems, water, shed protection, ag, but then certainly layering that information about climate change, extreme event resiliency um, as part of our work as well. Could I ask a question ask about a question? this? Uh oh, could we head to, back to that, to that slide? I, I just wanted to understand, um, you have this far above average um, designation and I can see the little dark green spots. W what makes those uh, more resilient um, than 
than others, uh, uh, like again, the above average area, how is that um, determined? Um, there are a handful of factors and I would probably, I need to dig into the literature from Nature Conservancy, but they're looking at um, kind of an, an east, east or west east um, migration opportunity. So looking at cooler temperatures on the coast, um, warming heading inland and opportunities for connecting um, the landscape uh, as, as temperatures change and as we see changes in um, climatic water deficit, so water availability. Um, and it's looking at kind of deep canyons where there may be wetted shaded areas that um, may serve as uh, areas of refuge. So there's a handful of factors um, that were sort of all incorporated into a modeled output. And okay. I, I can share more if you if you want to dig in to that. Uh, yeah, if I do, I'll get in touch. Thank you. Okay. Sounds I have great. a quick question. Um, this is Jean. Uh, I, I'm very concerned about uh, mountain lions uh, being able to get through. The genetic diversity has gotten very, very tough for them. Um, have you worked with Quinton Martins at all? He's a connectivity linkage expert who lives in Sonoma County. Um, we have not worked with Quinton to uh, address necessarily genetic diversity for mountain lion populations, but, but rather have used his work to um, inform uh, our approach to uh, protecting land so that it is a connected uh, and oh, open good. landscape for migration, mm -hmm. um, but not not so specific as to get into um, you know individual uh, species. Any further questions? Let's go for this. Okay. This is beautiful. Woohoo! <laughs> Last slide for me, I think, and then it's off to Kim. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, so I, I did want to sort of summarize, uh, since this is the Forest Conservation Working Group, how the work of Vital Lands Initiative and now as we're moving forward towards implementation can support forest protection. Um, so we will continue to respond as landowners submit applications to Ag and Open Space. We have a process by which we evaluate projects and we did determine if a project meets our organization's goals. Um, so we're gonna, we will continue to work in that way. We're refining our evaluation process to ensure that all the goals and areas that are mapped as high priority in vital lands um, are incorporated into this evaluation process. Um, but I think most, but something that we're all very excited to do is um, this concept of proactive land conservation. So taking this information um, through the Vital Lands Network, overlaying information about hazard risk reduction, uh, carbon sequestration potential, sort of other co-benefits um, and identifying specific properties that that we would like to target for land conservation and, and you know, sending out the mailer, making contact with that landowner um, and, and really being uh, effective uh, in protecting the most important areas. And certainly are looking forward to leaning on and collaborating with groups such as the Forest Conservation Working Group to uh, develop relationships with landowners, uh, especially. Um, I have a question, Allison, about this this um, problem of having most of our forests be so vulnerable to a, a variety of problems. But right now, I talk about fire because they have had fire suppression, and and so they are and they're not managed, you know, um, as we now know they need to be. So if you have a landowner. But yet you see this forest uh, as a really in, important forest, but it needs a lot of management to bring it back to, you know, a, a balance, I guess. So would that interfere with you doing a transaction on that particular type of property? Um, maybe Kim can offer a little bit more. It sort of ties into the, maybe the Weeks Ranch example, but we... If a property is identified by our 
our organization is important to protect. There are ways um, either through requiring a management plan or um, including certain terms in the easement that will um, ensure uh, we're sort of weighing the protection of conservation values. So say old growth mature forests on a property versus um, and finding a way for that landowner to manage the property into the future um, in a way that both uh, enhances sort of the, the, the ecosystem health and meets any of the landowner's needs, um, you know, for timber harvesting or, or whatever, um, whatever else they identify as a need for the property. So um, right. it's not a barrier. We, we, it's a negotiation with the landowner to find a way to okay. uh, perpetual protection while also you know, managing the land in a really What way. about all the hundreds of thousands of acres that have already been burned? Uh, is that gonna prevent you from wanting to work, work with, uh, with those uh, lands and those habitats? No, um, I would say, there's maybe more work for us to to learn about the condition of the property and any potential challenges with stewardship of a conservation easement. But we recognize that properties that are burned are, um, I know recovery is a challenging term, but the, the vegetation impacts are temporary, short term, and oftentimes these burns have been beneficial. Um, and so we're very interested um, in, in protecting the land for its, its open space and natural benefits and, and recognizing that it will change over time. So um, I don't think that that is necessarily a, a barrier for us. That's, that's a great uh, comment. Thank you so much. I think it really um, uh, is a great segue into the stewardship level of work that the Ag and Open Space does. And, I just wanna go quickly through some of the things that the stewardship program is responsible for after the easement is negotiated with the landowner. So first of all, a baseline report is done to kind of give you a sense of what's on the property, making sure that the, uh, there's a clear understanding of what a building envelope might be or uh, special resources that need to be protected. Uh, monitoring is absolutely essential for us to be able to do over time so that we know that the easement's being respected and um, the conservation values have been protected. And then there's enforcement for things that are done uh, that might challenge or, or uh, damage the conservation values. And then there's use requests. And I wanted to kind of take this opportunity to share with you a case study uh, where a salvage harvest was requested by a property called Weeks Ranch and use this as a little case study about how ag and open space can actually help participate in the recovery of a, a forested land after a burn had gone through. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just to give you a sense of this property, um, it's out uh, north of uh, Sugarloaf and um, east of Saddle Mountain Open Space Preserve. It's uh, about 888 acres uh, and consisting of uh, the headwaters of Sonoma or Santa Rosa Creek and Mark West Creek, as well as Salt Creek. Uh, Mark West and, and, Sonoma, and Santa Rosa Creek, as you uh, probably know, have coho salmon as well as steelhead trout. So uh, those are very important uh, habitat to be able to protect, especially if it's the headwaters. And so that was largely one of the reasons that the um, property was considered by the ag and open space as far as the value of it uh, protecting that land. And then Sonoma Land Trust was also uh, critical for uh, identifying this property, working with us and the landowners to negotiate a proper easement for that area. And so um, the landowners used this land largely for uh, beef cattle production, but had some interest in harvesting trees uh, throughout time to be able to uh, use for their own personal use as well as to sell. And there were, there were some restrictions on how much uh, forest or how much they could harvest per year. Uh, but as I uh, point out in this slide, there were specific values, conservation values that were assigned to this easement, which included riparian habitat, wildlife corridors, as well as scenic landscape. Well, uh, the easement was uh, uh, negotiated in 2019. And then 2020, 
there was a, a burn across the area. Uh, the glass fire hit this property 100% and, um, and damaged uh, the forest and uh, the building envelopes. And fortunately, the landowners were able to um, preserve their home and uh, lots of the infrastructure for the cattle. Um, but this property, I just wanna go one slide ahead um, to show the impacts of the fire. Um, this is a, a, a photo imagery uh, post fire of the same uh, conservation easement. So you can see 100% of the forest was burned uh, in various degrees and severity. But I wanted to just kind of go back to the example of the property owner coming to us and saying, all right, we would like to do a salvage harvest of 252 acres of the dug fir that's still standing, uh, that's merchantable. Um, we hadn't considered uh, the logging roads uh, to do this. And so we need to widen our, log our roads to uh, uh -huh. allow uh, access to uh -huh. uh, logging trucks and uh -huh. remove some virtual trees, thus re reducing the amount of biomass that stays on the property and maybe uh, provoke larger fires in the future. So um, the landowner uh, submits this, uh, a draft, usually a draft emergency notification that he's going to submit to Cal Fire. And then we re evaluate uh, whether that type of activity is permitted by the conservation easement. And so this is a good example of how we worked with the landowner to come to uh, some clear um, recommendations or conditions to the approval of that type of salvage harvest, mm -hmm. uh, such as one of the highest priorities or the three kind of high priority needs for us for the open space district and the easement uh, was to conserve the and maintain the soil productivity of the site. We also wanted to make sure water quality wasn't adversely affected by this act activity. Mm -hmm. And then finally, that the forest health was and tried to be enhanced through so that wildlife passage and wildlife habitat was continued to uh, play a role across that property as their critical conservation value. So these are the uh, conditions that we approved that activity that um, the, they tried to do minimal passages of equipment across the, um, the burned uh, uh, soil uh, area or any of the areas that were burned. And then uh, try to retain snag uh, retention throughout the property and, and on the numbers of like five to 10 snags per acre but group them, organize the uh, snags so that they um, provided greater opportunity for habitat enhancement. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of the factors that we thought would, would help uh, wildlife to be able to reincorporate that as, as passage or habitat for everything from amphibians to um, bird nesting sites and things like that. And then clearly mark the, uh, the uh, class two and three uh, streams so that the buffers could be uh, determined and making sure that there's no activity close to uh, Santa Rosa Creek. So those are just kind of the conditions as a way to kind of give you a sense of how we can proactively participate in improving the, uh, the, the effects of a fire on a particular habitat that has, or a property as a conservation. Wow, fantastic. So that kind of gives you a good idea about what, uh, what we're doing and from the, the macro scale all the way down through uh, vital lands, how we consider uh, high priority conservation areas, down to the nitty gritty of what we do with landowners. How do we uh, figure out a, a practical solution that still respects the conservation values that are being protected uh, and still allow them to be able to do activities such as a salvage harvest after, after a severe burn. So wow. with that, we'd like to conclude. We really appreciate your, your patience in going through this. Uh, do we have any quick questions that uh, people would like to sh toss out there? That was just um, really lovely. And of course, there'll be more questions, but I don't know if we, you have time, but maybe we can put some time on the next agenda to continue the questions Q&A if, if we need to do that. Fantastic. We really appreciate your patience. Um, and I hope that is uh, helpful for you to understand what Ag and Open Space does, as well as our relationships with the different landowners across the area. Uh, Kim, I have a quick, can, can there be a site visit to that ranch? 
Um, again, this is, the, this is a great example where the landowner is still holding on as a private landowner. Uh, we can certainly talk to him. Uh, Matt Green is the forester on the property. Um, as they see it as an educational opportunity, I think it'd be a great idea. But I, I would like to I would like to explore that. Uh, that right. is really a, a seminal example of what we need to do on so many properties. So I, I would love to explore that with you. Absolutely, we can certainly consider that, and we can talk to the landowner see if he's willing to do that. Thanks. Woohoo! All right. So I guess. Um, Unless there's some major, you know, does anybody have a, a, a last minute question? Well, this has been fantastic meeting and uh, presentation. Thank you, Open Space District, for being there. Thanks to the voters who voted for it. That includes all of us. Um, maybe not Peter, because he's. He... I am still a big supporter, though. <laughs> that was a good presentation. Okay, guys. Well, you all have a, a good rest of your week and a great weekend, and we'll talk to you all um, as soon as we can. All right, folks. Thanks Thank very much. much. Thank Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for a great presentation. Okay, bye. Thank See you next month.